they're going to know who he is and they're going to know who they are in him and ready to serve him. And when Brother Richard gets them, he's going to be able to just send them on out to uh, fully equipped to do what God has called them to do. I've chosen the title for our time together today, Children Are Precious. And there are some things that we need to do and some things that we need to understand if we esteem children as precious, if we see them as God sees them. The first thing we need to do, come on in. The first thing we need to do is be committed. We need to accept the call to minister to God's little ones. In John 21, 15, Jesus says that if you love me, feed my lambs. Now, there are many days you can go to work or many Sundays you can come in to minister, Sunday night or Wednesday night, and things aren't going so well. And you can say, okay, that's it, I quit. How many of us have been there? But if we're committed, we're not going to give up that easy. If we're committed and we're accepting the call that God has placed on our life, then we're going to say, okay, Lord, what am I supposed to learn from this tonight? What could I have done different? How could I have planned differently? What did I miss? What did I not hear? We're not going to throw up our hands and say, I quit. Because if we accept the commitment, accept the call, and be committed to what God's called us to do, only he can move us, okay? Only he can say, okay, this, this job is done. Let's move on to the next. So we're going to be committed. Everyone that's going to be committed, look to your neighbor and say, I'm committed. Amen. The next area, if we esteem children as precious, we need to have a happy heart about what God has called us to do. Be happy and excited about the opportunity we have to encourage parents to be instrumental in molding behaviors and developing attitudes which will become a lifelong part of children's lives. Wow, did you know you do all that? What an awesome privilege to be a part of these children. In early childhood ministry, we're not just ministering to that little, little one. As Brother Richard says, he ministers to families who have teenagers. We minister to families with young children. Our job is not just to provide a healthy, safe learning environment for children to grow and be nurtured in, but we need to uh, encourage the parents. We need to set examples and guidelines. The next area, if we esteem children as precious, is we need to be interceding for them. For in Lamentations 2.19, the word says, Cry out, arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the watches. Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up your hands toward him for the life of your young children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. They're not just fainting from physical hunger. They're fainting for spiritual hunger for emotional hunger, for physical hunger, physical touch. Do you know how many children get up in the morning that are trained to dress themselves that never get a pat, never get a hug, never get a kiss from their parents? And we wonder why our young girls, the age of young girls becoming pregnant is younger and younger. They're starving, they're hungry for a touch Allow God to, to use you. He doesn't place these children on our heart in the middle of the night or driving down the road or in the middle of the um, grocery store just for us to think about them. Allow him to place them on your heart and in your thought for you to lift up a prayer for them. Our prayers are to God as a railroad track is to a train. Now think about that. Watchman Nee has said that in one of his books. A train is almighty and powerful, strong, and it can go anywhere, up a mountain, around a mountain, across water, down the avenues, down the streets, if the track is laid. Our God is an awesome God. He can do anything. He can go anywhere. He can be everywhere at one time. But he has chosen to make us free vessels, to make a choice, to use our words to lay the track for his will to be done. That's awesome. If we can just get a hold of it and realize that 
that little boy or little girl that's in your room that just really makes you want to cry, that really makes you wish he'd stayed home today, God has him in your, in your room for some reason. And it's not to make your life miserable. He knows that he can trust you to be his hands extended to love that child. He knows that he can interrupt your thought and that you're going to intercede for that child. Well, how do we intercede? There are many, many books out there today teaching us how to intercede. Pick up a book. Read those prayers out loud for those children until they become part of you. And God will use you. We may never know until we get to heaven how our words, how our times, how our brief prayers affected the lives of those that we allowed God to intrude our thought, intrude our time, so that we can lift up prayers for them. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to intercede. Amen. The next area, if we esteem children as precious, then we need to know how to set limits for children. In providing limits for young children, we help them develop self-control. We live in a world with rules that help us live in harmony with others, our family, our friends, and community. It is important that children know what we expect of them, and what we expect of them should be developmentally and age-appropriate. Now, what does developmentally and age-appropriate mean? To understand that, we've got to dig a little bit, study a little bit. Does the word say study to prove thy, show thyself approved? Well, it's not just the word. Brother Richard says how much money he spends on books and tapes. Learning, learning. We need to learn all that we can learn about the young children, and the ages that we work with. The next area, if we want to let others know that we esteem children as precious, then we're going to look into the development of children. We're going to learn how to prepare developmentally and age-appropriate activities. Our goal in understanding development in children is that once we understand young children, make ourselves aware of the basic needs, characteristics of that child, then we can enjoy watching them being a part of their lives, of their unfolding. The word of development means the act or process of developing. Isn't it neat to be able to prepare activities that help a child go from one skill level to the next? But you're not going to understand that if you do not learn. And, and where can we go to learn about development of children? Go to your um, daycare in your community. There are faith-based daycare centers in just about every center in every city and town and go to them and say, how do your workers get training? Do they go to the local junior college? Do you do training on your campus? Can I be a part of that? How do I get started? I want to know all that I can know. I want to learn all that I can learn so that I can better minister to the young children that God has in my life. doesn't mean you have to go back to college. The little junior classes that they offer at um, the junior college here are like eight weeks one night a week, two hours a night. But you'll walk away from there with a wealth of information and a new understanding of how to meet the needs of the children. I think it's exciting to be a part of development of children. It's an event. It's a happening. What do we do when that child, we've got the new um, infant on the floor, and we get down there with them? We, we teach them how to crawl, right? We get down there and we rock with them and we start crawling. Then they go to the next level of development and we help them walk. Come on, walk to mommy. Turn around now, walk back to daddy. That's an event. It's a happening in their life. So is coming to an understanding of, of who God is. So is understanding that the trees out there are green and God made them. Do you understand where I'm going? Is this becoming clear? Understand the development. Would we expect the same of a two-year-old as we do a five-year-old? 
No, but a lot of times we're in a position that we have to place our two-year-olds in rooms with our five-year-olds. How can we make that work? Well, if we understand the development of the, each of the age groups in our room, we can provide activities in this corner for our two-year-olds, in this corner for our three and four-year-olds, and over here in this corner for our five and six-year-olds, and all come together for group activities. But we wouldn't know to do that if we didn't understand the different development stages of children. Let's move on to our next area. If we esteem children as precious, then we need to learn to respect them. In 1 Peter 2.17 says, Show proper respect to everyone. If we as teachers, caregivers, and parents want children to be respectful, we must be an example of respect. Now, what are some ways we can show respect? We can greet a child at eye level. Make eye contact with them. Look at them when they're speaking to you and respond to their questions. How many times do we just stay so busy and we, we hear them over here, but we just stay so engrossed in what we're doing, we ignore them and think that they will go away? Well, we've said something to them that what they're saying is not important. Do you think our Heavenly Father ever gets so busy that what we say to Him is not important? I think not. And if we want to be an example of God's love and being a godly example, then we need to show them respect. Ask the Lord other ways that you can show respect to your children. I always say, yes, sir, no, sir, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am. It might be a South thing, but it's a heart thing for me. My kindergarten class, it was yes, sir, to the little boys. It was yes, ma'am. I expected them to greet me in the same manner. How could I do anything else but to greet them? By being an example. We want our children to be safe. We need to be an example of safe. If any of you have any young children in your home now, one day you will be teaching them to drive. So let me encourage you to not do any of those rolling stops at the stop sign, okay? Start stopping now because it will come back to haunt you when they get 15, okay? Running that yellow light, okay? It's going to come back to haunt you when they get 15 because they pay attention. Why? We have been the example. If we want our children to, to pray uh, when, they, when they're injured or to pray for the sick, how are they going to learn that? By us being an example, respecting where they are and being an example for them. Why do we need to educate ourselves? When we understand the development of children, we can understand that infants to walking, they need comfort and consistency in their caregivers. You're not going to have five different people working in that room every other week. Try to rotate with just then two workers. These two are here the first and third Sunday. The next two are the second and fourth. They want to see a familiar face from time to time. And we don't want to change their rooms any more often than we have to. Because when they come to church, it needs to be a comfortable place. You like your own seat when you come in the sanctuary. How many of you sit in this, around the same area, if not the same seat, every time you come to church? Okay, why do we do that? We're comfortable there. Consistency. Our infants can't tell us what they want, but we know that they're more comfortable. They're not crying. They're not fussy when we have consistency in their care. Toddlers need competency, which means they need to have the ability to walk, run, and climb. Now, you're not going to have anything in a toddler room that you are not giving them permission to touch because they're exploring. Okay, if you've got a ladder in that room, if you don't want the, the children to climb on that ladder, remove it. This is their space. You walk in this room, you expect to be able to touch the chairs, to look at the books. We had some of you up here looking at the puppet stage. Now, it would, would not be very nice of me if I said, no, you just have to sit right there and look. It's real, it's real pretty, isn't it? It's real purple. It looks soft, doesn't it? Well, that's what we're doing to our children when we have things in their rooms 
that we do not allow them to touch. Understand that, toddler. Understand that two-year-old twos have a need to gain control. How many of you know two-year-olds are in control? <laughs> they need control of their bodies, and they need to gain independence. So we have to tell them what we're going to allow them to do. Now, they're going to test the waters and push us a little bit, but if we're consistent with what we're going to allow them to do, guess what? It won't be so hard after a while. They're going to know that I can't push Miss Bloodworth. When she said walking feet, she means walking feet. I don't like that timeout chair. It's not fun over there. Threes need creativity. They increase in vocabulary and are developing imaginations and creativity. How many of you know a three-year-old that likes to talk? Yeah. Fours enjoy showing confidence. How many of you know a four-year-old that says, oh, watch me, I can do this. Look, I can do this. Because they've learned something and they want to show you, hey, I've mastered this. I am confident, I can do this. But do they like you to, to ask them to do something new and different? Not fours. We have to ease them into things that are new and different. But how about a five-year-old? They like those challenges. Yes, give me something new to master. Five-year-olds will keep you on your toes. They will keep you busy. Hungry for new things. So that letter was E for educate, educating ourselves. The next letter in the word children is N for nonverbal communication. Wow. How many times do we roll our eyes, take a deep breath, or turn our back? What is this saying to the children, to our coworkers, to our ministry team, to our own children in our home, to our spouses? Can we say, Lord, help me be aware of my nonverbal communication? Look to your neighbor and say, I'm going to be aware of my nonverbal communication. Amen. If we esteem children as precious, our next letter is A. We need to be aware. Be aware of your job description. Know what is expected. What are your responsibilities? And to whom are you responsible to? What will and will not be tolerated in your department? Policies and procedures that you will be responsible for enforcing, like dress code, personal hygiene. Who recruits the volunteers? Who hires the paid staff? You know, we get in trouble a lot, especially in, in church ministry, because we assume it's not a good thing. We need to know, okay? Be aware. The next letter is R. If we esteem children as precious, we need to remember that we will give an account for every idle word that we speak and that death and life are in the power of our tongue. And that some people like to make cutting remarks. How many of you have heard teachers in your department make cutting remarks, but the words of a wise soothe and heal? We want our words to be uplifting, edifying, calming, healing to our children. Even that one that is climbing the wall, okay? If you are calm and cool and praising the one or two little things that you find him doing, that's correct, and speak blessings to him, you're going to start seeing changes. Why? Because the word says that out of thy mouth is life and death. The next letter is E, esteem. If we see children as precious, then we need 
to not be selfish. In Philippians 2, 3, it says, don't be selfish. Don't live and make a good to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Now, in children's ministry, we all know that we don't get a lot of these. Right? But we're not doing what we're doing for the others around us. Only for the little ones. Okay? And one day, there's a scripture in the Word that says, If you often even a cup of water unto these little ones, I tell you, you shall not lose your reward. What a blessing. We give out a lot more than water in my department. How about you? How many, how many hours of your free time, of your time, do you invest in your plans, your lesson plans? How many things do you cut out? How many bags of uh, construction paper do you buy? How many gallons of Kool-Aid do you bring? How many bags of cookies do you bring? And how many hours do you invest in praying? For your children. I think we've got a lot of award, rewards waiting for us when we get up there. That does not make us better than the other. It just shows that we are aware of what we've got coming to us. God expects us to provide a healthy, safe learning environment for these children, conducive to the Holy Spirit to minister to them in. We know our job description to love them and lead them to him. That was the next letter, P. Plan and prepare a healthy, safe learning environment. Now, how do we do that? Number one, we know that we're going to have age and size appropriate chairs and tables in our rooms. And if they're too big or not safe, then get them out of there. We can do finger painting and sand art and water uh, play on the floor on plastic tablecloths. They work great. We could even have a picnic on the floor every Sunday on a plastic tablecloth so that our room is safe. We're not going to have anything in there that's not safe. Healthy. I don't know about you, but I have a lot of trouble with this area. We don't allow runny noses in the nursery. And we do that for several reasons. We're not just a church family. We have a lot of people coming from around the world visiting us. And they're bringing their germs that we're not used to. And they're coming in our environment where we have germs that they're not used to. Hepatitis, AIDS, there's so much out there today. And just because I know you and I know that your child doesn't have AIDS doesn't mean that the, the child coming in I don't know if they have hepatitis or what they might have. So to not be a respecter of person just because I know Susie over here and I know her children is probably allergy. But that, that is a, a policy that we've chose to abide by, to make the area healthy. I'm not going to have anything ungodly in there to make the room unhealthy. Okay? And the way that I've stayed away from saying that toy is not acceptable and that toy is not acceptable, I just say, leave the toys in the car. Okay? Mom, Dad, if he's got something in his pocket, will you take it and keep it for him till, till you come back to pick him up? That way I'm not pointing my finger at Mom and Dad and saying, why do you allow him to have that Pokemon in his pocket? Now, if mom and dad want to talk to me about that, I can share with them, but I'm not going to point my finger. Does that make sense? Have you had to confront that already? Now, learning environment. How do we provide a learning environment? It goes back to development and education. We've got to study and find out how can I help these children learn. If I want to bring the point across to God created, creation is one of my favorite lessons to do because you've got the fish and you've got the birds and you've got the colors. Just look at all the different things we can do with colors. Let's move on to the next letter, R. Reward. We've covered that earlier, but days that you're 
ready to throw in the towel, ready to take that deep breath and say, I think I'm walking in an area that I'm no longer called. Just remember, just remember the reward. It is so neat to have one of those little ones crawl up in your lap and say, I have a bobo, will you pray for it? Where do they get that? Mom and dad and, and maybe your example. So if we can remember all the tedious things that we do and, and where our goal is, what the mark we're, we're shooting for, and remember that reward. That scripture is found in Matthew 10, 42. And it says, And whoever gives one of these little ones in rank or in influence, even a cup of water because he is my disciple, surely I declare to you, he shall not lose his reward. If we esteem children as precious, we need to be encouragers. We need to encourage parents in their role to train up a child in the way he should go. In Proverbs 22, 6, we're all familiar with that scripture. It says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Think about the parents that are represented in your ministry. How many of them are first-generation Christian parents? How many of them did not have godly parents to be examples to them? How many, even going back another generation, didn't have godly grandparents? How are they going to learn how to bless their children in the morning? How are they going to learn how to be godly examples? If we encourage them, have a parent night, have books that they can read. Really, sit down and read the good book, put it on tape, and let them hear you read it. If you can't afford to buy books on tape for your ministry, we need to be feeding them, leading them, guiding them, encouraging them as parents. Dr. Dobson, anything Dr. Dobson has out there, I really encourage you to get in the hands of your, your parents with young children. He's a wealth of knowledge, and his ministry just ministers a lot. If we esteem children as precious, we need to remember we can. We can do all things who, through Christ who strengthens us. If we esteem children as precious in the sight of the Lord, we need to be able to instruct children in the way of God. How? In Psalms... 32 8 it says I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go I will guide you with my eyes if we're going to instruct others we've got to have something from him in us to give so in preparing to instruct children we're going to spend time with the Lord we're going to know in here so that we can give out in instructing children, what are some ways we instruct them? By an example? By consistency? By teaching? The next letter is O. Be obedient. In Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. God has blessings for us here on this earth, too. Be obedient to the call to minister to his little ones. Be obedient to the things that you know of the Lord to be right and ask him to direct you in the things that you're unsure of. If we esteem children as precious, we're going to use the time wisely that God has given us to minister to his children. I've had people say to me, walk in our classrooms and they look a lot like a daycare room and say, how do you teach the word in here with all these toys around? God made children to learn by doing. So when I've got some over here in the block area sharing blocks and building a tower, all you have to do is just go over and encourage, I like the way you are sharing together. That's a principle. Doesn't the Bible tell us to share, to be giving? We bring the word to where they're at. Okay, we want them to 
show love and kindness, then we're not going to allow them to be unkind to one another in our classrooms. That's part of using our time wisely. If we're expecting them to obey the rules, then we're going to spend time making sure that they understand the rules. That's using our time wisely. The last letter is S. And I've chose the word Savior. All that we do and all that we prepare for we should be leading these children to an understanding as Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. How can changing a diaper, wiping runny noses, dealing with biters and kickers, and screamers, how can all that lead to leading them to an understanding of Jesus Christ as their Savior? Do you know in infancy they need to trust? What do we have to do to come to Jesus Christ? We have to trust. So it starts way back there in that baby room that when they cry, they can trust Miss Shirley. That's our baby room caregiver. They can trust Miss Shirley to go over the checklist. Are they hungry? Are they wet? Do they just need to be rocked? Do they need to play? Or do they need mommy? And in our classrooms, we do not hesitate to call our parents. We, um, we feel like that God gave these children to the parents. And we want to encourage them, but when their children need them, we call them. We call them for a couple of reasons. If a child is crying and we can't control them or we can't comfort them, they probably need mommy or daddy. Okay? If they are not being obedient, we have the strike three, you're out rule in the nursery. Our rules are walking feet, quiet inside voices, hands and feet to yourself, and obey the teacher at all times. And if we have a child that's having trouble with any of these areas, they go to time out. And in time out, they're prayed with, they understand what they did wrong, and they're encouraged to go back and have fun. But they know that if they get in trouble again, strike two, mom and dad are called. Now you mean you're gonna call a parent out of church because their child misbehaved twice? Yes, I am. Because the Bible says parents train a child in the way they should go. Not Miss Bloodworth, not nursery givers, not Pastor Van. That child might just need a hug from mom and prayer from mom. That child might need to go out in the parking lot with mom. Okay? But I do this for for two reasons, okay? We're letting the child know that mom and dad care, and we're making mom and dad care because if they don't answer their nursery number, then, then we have to talk to them about, we might not can care for your child anymore because when your number goes up, we need you. And if you're not gonna answer your call, then we can't care for your child. What am I trying to do with these rules? Am I trying to make parents miserable? No. I'm trying to lead them into an understanding that their children are their responsibility. When you bring them to my department, you're giving me the opportunity to minister to them. You're giving me permission to be a part of their life. You're not giving them to me to raise. That's your responsibility. So at strike two, mommy comes or daddy comes. They pray with or they discipline. They understand that if little Johnny or little Susie gets in trouble for the third time, they're theirs for the night or for the day, whatever reason. Now, I do that. One or two things are going to happen. You need to make sure your pastor agrees with you and supports you, okay? Parents are going to come to you and say, I don't know what else to do, Miss Bloodworth. I've tried this, and I've tried that, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I really don't know what to do with them. I don't have all the answers, but the two of us together, or three of us together, lifting the situation up to the Lord, pulling out all the parenting books, pulling out the strong-willed child book, we're gonna come to an answer. 
we're going to come to an understanding that this child is not in control. We are in control. We're the boss. I had one of our parents come up to me last night and said, Miss Blubber, thank you for training our, brainwashing our children, I think is the word they used. Said um, this dad was correcting uh, his daughter and said, now mommy might have told you yes, but daddy's the boss. And I said no. And she looked at me and said, uh-uh, Miss B's the boss. <laughs> And they had to explain to her that Miss B's the boss at church, but Daddy's the boss at home. But consistency. Okay, those parents are either going to say, I've had one get in my face and say, you mean that you're going to send my child out of the nursery? When are you going to get some workers back here that can just deal with it? When my wife and I worked in the nursery, we just dealt with it. When are they? You've got paid staff back here. What do you expect of them? I had to back up and say, I'm sorry, I think that there's a misunderstanding here. What I expect of your child and what you expect of me is different. So what we, we need to regroup, okay? We have a training video series called Training Children in Troubled Times by Willie George, and I would like for you and your wife to take that home and, and view it, and then come back and let me know what we need to do to help you in this role. But in the meantime, you need to just keep your child with you until you call and make an appointment with us, with Pastor Van or myself, and let's, let's discuss this. They were appalled that I had asked them to take their child out of the nursery. They went straight across the street to complain. But you know what? Our pastor says you deserve what you tolerate. And the office said, if you have a problem in the children's department, if you have a problem with the nursery director, you need to take it back to the nursery director. Do you know that those children are some of the very best behaved we have in the nursery today? And it's because I, the parents became uncomfortable with being called out of church all the time to discipline or deal with or have to take their children with them. I didn't do that to make that parent miserable. I did that to encourage that parent to step up in position to what God has called them to do. Now, not every church, not every pastor is going to give you permission to do that. You need to know the heart of your pastor. He might have a different vision for your department, and you have to come in alignment, line up, submit to authority. And if God has told you one thing and your pastor is telling you another, then maybe you need to move on down the road. You cannot stay there and be a hindrance to what your pastor says. If you can't submit to your pastor, you need to get out of the way. And I'm going to tell you, making children behave in church and in the nursery is a big issue in some places. But in, in our calling parents, we want to let them know we're not pointing a finger at you. I've given my pager number to single moms. That's the first thing they say, well, I'm a single mom, and I just, I'm just tired. Well, I give them my pager, tell them to call me, encourage them to call, and I'll pray with you. I don't have all the answers, but my Heavenly Father does, and I will pray with you. I'll, you don't have to walk this alone. So sometimes being an encourager to parents means that we're going to have to step over here and really be flesh for them. Be God in the flesh for them. A helpmate in the flesh for them. One of our workers came to me the other day and said, Miss Bloodworth, I just want to say thank you for being our director. She's working in a daycare in, in the city, and it's a faith-based center, but Faith-based centers in the world have a lot to deal with. They have a lot of children that are not from Christian homes. And they have to keep those children because they have a budget to meet. And sometimes they tolerate disobedience and they tolerate behavior that should not be tolerated. And this young lady had been in a class with a little boy that had hit a couple of teachers, that had spit, and had just really been a burden. And so she's used to our policy that she brings the child to me and I pray with the child. I talk with the child and then we take them back to their class and the next time we get the parent involved with this director, she went and asked the director to please pray with him. Pray, do something. 
and the director says you need to take him back to class. We need to pray for our, our daycares in the area. There are many moms that are not out there working because they want to leave their children. They're out there working because they need to feed them. They need to put clothes on them. And so our daycare centers, if we can get our centers turned around, the government is after our centers. They want to rule and govern what is taught in our centers. But we need to support our faith-based centers and let it lift them up in prayer. Go in as a church. If you need training in um, nursery or care, go in your faith-based centers and say, can I volunteer a day a week in your center? Because you're going to get some hands-on experience that you can take back to your ministry. But you can support them in prayer whether you can physically support them or not. In your ministry at church, you need to let your volunteers and your workers know how much you appreciate them. Because we couldn't do what we do at Brownsville without our volunteers. We couldn't minister. On Sunday morning, we have anywhere from 70 to 90 four- and five-year-olds in our powerhouse. Now, Melissa is my assistant. She and I could not go in there and minister to those children and not be available to the other eight rooms. You've got to have a ministry team with you to walk along beside you. And to keep them, you've got to encourage them and you've got to support them. And we start there with training, your policy and procedure. You know your responsibilities, your job description, your volunteers need to understand theirs. I want everybody doing the same across the board. We're all going to discipline the same. We're all going to clean the room the same. We're all going to greet children the same. We're all going to let children leave the room with the same policy and procedure. If that parent doesn't have the security card, the child doesn't go. There's a lot to cover. I want to leave a few minutes for you to ask questions and have time to share with one another. Is there any questions that we might could share? We have about 10 minutes. Yes. The rules of the, for the child, walking feet, hands and feet to yourself, quiet inside voices, and obey the teacher. Yes, ma'am. She's saying, what do you do about volunteers that you put them on a schedule and they're expected to be there and they do not show up, but they don't send their children, but the next Sunday, it's not their Sunday and they're there. I do a rotation schedule for our volunteers. And um, I, I really seek the Lord and ask the Lord to make them volunteer, not me have to go pull them out. Um, there's some advantages of saying your child's in the nursery, you have to be here, and there's some disadvantages. There are some parents that you're not going to want back there, okay? But I do a rotation schedule, and I make up the schedule and mail it to them. And it has everybody's Sunday and their phone number on there. And if they can't make it their Sunday, they are responsible for calling the person on the list and finding someone to substitute for them. And I just, we're blessed here with, we have like 65 volunteers. Now in a church this size, we could, you know, we could very easily use 600. They rotate around um, one, once every six to eight weeks. But I would just call the parent and let them know the situation that that puts you in. Um, encourage them, build them up, be excited about what you do so that it will spill over to them. Let them know what a blessing they're going to get out of, out of being there. Most of the time, parents do not follow through with volunteering because they're intimidated or they're not sure of what they are, is expected of them. Okay? I copy the lessons. I have it at the door. They can pick it up a week early. I have all the supplies. 
Uh, I let them know if, if teaching the lesson is not your cup of tea, you just want to be in there and love on children, let me know. I'll, I'll put you with a co-teacher that, that loves to teach, and you can learn from them. So find out why the volunteers that you have are not, are not showing up. Okay, I had a question back here first. I'll get to you. Yes, ma'am. I, when Revival started, I had to look for a curriculum that had five services in it or five days in it. And I went to a Christian daycare program. And it's uh, We Learn is the name of it. It's a Baptist curriculum, but it is daycare. It's got center activities, um, Bible story, um, that type um, thing. Zero to two, we do not have structured teaching. Uh, The question was, what do we do with children um, with revival services? Children, when they walk in, have um, center opportunities. We have the block area. We have uh, home living, and, and we have um, puzzles and arts and crafts. From the time a child walks in the room until 9 o'clock, they have free time. They're going to have story time. They're going to have praise and worship. We do some activities to large motor skills to burn some energy, and they'll have snack time, bathroom breaks. At 9 o'clock, lights go out and Christian videos go in. Children have that little biological clock in them that says it's time to go to sleep. If we allow them to stay up when revival first began till 12, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, everybody's schedule is going to be off. Adults can adapt and adjust to that, but little ones cannot. So we felt it was important that we had a lights out. They do not have to go to sleep, but they are required to rest on their mat. Okay. I saw some hands over here. Yes, ma'am. Right. Amen. Okay. She was saying that when her volunteers do not show up, she calls and makes sure that they're okay. Is there anything wrong? Is there something I can pray? What is she doing there? She's building a relationship with them. The next next thing There's curriculum out there for, for that age group. You just need to, to look, and that will meet your, your needs. Good. Good. God will let you know. Good. Good. That's great. If you've got the space to split them up, it's better to split them up. But if you do not have the manpower and you do not have the, the room space, then, then keeping them together. But kind of dividing your room up. This area is for two-year-olds and th twos and threes, and over here fours and fives. When that can be done, that way everybody knows what to expect and who they're responsible to. Yes, ma'am.
Well, we try to accommodate our special needs children in our classrooms. What that they're a. Oh, you mean special what nursery? What you oh. They have to uh, fill out a facility request form through the office, and the office says what we provide a nursery for and what we do not. Okay, and so then I have to be notified two weeks ahead of time that this event is going to take place. And one week before the event, I am given a list of the children and their ages that will be participating in that nursery. So does that happen? Yes, ma'am. And it happens only because I went to our um, associate pastor and said, this is an area that we can limit uh, excess spending. If I know exactly what children are coming in their age group, then I know how many workers to have. And if they want to have this event, they're letting their group know, then this is what needs to take place. Is it perfect yet? No, but by faith it will be. <laughs> Can you talk about your special needs nursery? Special needs nursery, if we had the space, we could have just one room, one, one place for special needs. And you really need a special needs instructor, someone that has definitely has training uh, in that area. We had a special needs uh, ministry in the beginning of revival, and what that pertailed of was a couple of adults would stay with that child, either walking in, in the back of the sanctuary, or uh, if the child could go in the nursery and just needed one-on-one, -on -one, then that adult stay with that child in the nursery. But um, we also, as they have gotten older, we've tried to incorporate the parents and get the parents, you be with them the second and fourth Sunday of the month, and we will uh, provide a volunteer to sit with them in Children's Church the first and third Sunday of the month. Because I want the parents to be a part of what they're doing so that they can take it home with them. Yes, ma'am. You talked about you've got volunteers and the rotation and keeping them consistent. Um, is there some staff then on Sunday morning, paid staff Sunday, that's the same person, and then you just bring in volunteers underneath the yes, paid staff? So. Yes, ma'am. Now, I use volunteers in our three, fours, and fives. Paid staff, same faces, two and under. With a paid staff in there with them. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. On Sunday morning, I have a new blessings. It's birth to crawling. I have um, cuddly crawlers crawling until they start walking. Uh, have wonderful walkers as our younger walkers. Wise walkers as our older walkers. Uh, tremendous twos and terrific twos are two separate rooms. Younger twos, older twos. Um, treasured threes and um, talented threes. And then our fours and fives are together in powerhouse. One more time. After you three. Did you, um, it's, it's in our manual. Did you pick up one of the nursery manuals? All, all those names are in there. Might be easier for you. I saw some hands over here. I'll come back. We have a, a policy and procedure manual for our nursery. That was one of the first responsibilities that was placed on me when I got here. And I can tell you, I had no clue. I mean, I knew what to do and knew how to do it, but how to get that over to someone else, I really had trouble with. But the Lord sent someone in my life that she used to write manuals for, for our college. And um, it was a breeze for her. She just says, no, what do you want to do about this? And I said, da, 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 da. So we do have the book. And it's called um, Nursery Preschool Manual. Is that correct, Melissa? Pastor Van has one for children's ministry, and then there's a Nursery Preschool Manual. It should be at our table. Okay. Nursery Preschool Manual. Okay, back here in the white. They have to go through our training of our policy. I have a workshop called No Hire Call, and where I take our policy and procedure manual, and I go through what we do and why we do it, so that we have that once a year for our volunteers. Our paid staff, most of them come from daycares during the day, and they come at night. If they do not 
work in a daycare during the day, they have to have had some type of daycare experience or a lot of children's ministry experience. Yes, ma'am. What I would have to do is get together and with your policy and procedure manual because I wrote this program, or I did the video or the workshop strictly for Brownsville, but um, it's easy to adapt to, to your policies. The um, nursery workers, caregivers, are not allowed to let a child leave their room without the card. If a parent comes without the card, they bring them to, to my office. Melissa or I will, will share with the parent the importance of that card. I can no longer use that number because that card is out on this campus somewhere. And not everyone here is coming for a blessing from the Lord. They're here to get whatever trouble stirred up they can. And on that card, it plainly says, with this card, your child can be picked up. Okay? So once I, I share with the parent how important that card is and, and that we can't use it again, and then if everybody loses cards, then we're not going to have any cards, um, usually they go back and find it and bring it to me. Or they will, they will offer to pay for it. <laughs> But I still can't use the number. It's 3 o'clock. You've been a great class. I hope this has been an encouragement and a blessing to you. Thank you.